What would you do if you got the opportunity to interview Christ Jesus? He's the Creator, Savior, and King of Kings. What would you ask Him? The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The Bible encourages us to ask questions, and Dr. Lake and myself invite you to thoroughly investigate the Seventh-day Adventist Christian faith. In today's podcast, we're going to be taking a close examination of three fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church, as the Answering Adventism broadcasts put out by Miles Kettleson are encouraging Seventh-day Adventist Christians to reconsider their beliefs, particularly belief number eight, the Great Controversy, belief number 10, the Experience of Salvation, and belief number 18, the Gift of Prophecy. This program will be divided into five sections, with the first section examining the Christian experience of Dr. Lake. The following three sections on the 8th, 10th, and 18th fundamental belief, and the last section on the culture of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church. To go back to my question from earlier about interviewing Jesus, Pontius Pilate had that chance. He asked, what is truth, and never stuck around for the answer. Don't make Pilate's mistake. Embrace Christ Jesus into your heart today, and please join us as we search out the matter of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian denomination. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Dr. Christopher Cernike, and today I have the honor of hosting Dr. Judd Lake. Dr. Judd Lake received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Theology from Southern Adventist University, his Master of Divinity degree from Andrews University, and his Doctor of Ministry degree in Practical Theology from the Reformed Theological Seminary, and his Doctor of Theology degree in Homiletical Methodology from the University of South Africa. He was a pastor in the Gulf States Conference of Seventh-day Adventists for nearly a decade, was a youth pastor and Bible teacher at Broadview Academy, and for over two decades has been a beloved professor of preaching and Adventist studies. Dr. Judd Lake is an advocate of expository preaching and is a Seventh-day Adventist apologist specializing in defending the prophetic ministry of Ellen White. Dr. Lake has authored three books on Ellen White, Ellen White Under Fire, A Nation in God's Hands, Ellen White in the Civil War, and The Pocket Ellen G. White Dictionary and he's co-authored and written papers on Ellen White and theology. He first became a Seventh-day Adventist after attending a Kenneth Cox evangelistic crusade and reading Ellen White's landmark book, Steps to Christ. And now, without further ado, good afternoon, Dr. Lake. How was your day, and how are you doing? Doing very well, Christopher. Having a good day, and, and uh, happy to share with you. I'm glad to hear that you're doing well, Dr. Lake. And with that, we're now moving on to the first section in our program. Dr. Lake, in your book, Ellen White Under Fire, you wrote, I remember reading the book, Steps to Christ, after I joined the Adventist Church. While poring over those pages during my lunch break in the shade of the cedar trees next to the gymnasium at J.O. Johnson High School in Huntsville, Alabama, Jesus spoke to my heart. From this reading of Steps to Christ, the joy of living for Jesus as a personal Savior and friend captured my imagination. After this experience, I never desired to return to my former life, and I've been a disciple of Jesus Christ now for more than 30 years. So Dr. Lake, can you please share what Christ Jesus has been like to you as a Savior and as a friend. Uh, just listening to you read that, it, uh, of course, the book was published 14 years ago, so now it's been 40-plus uh, years since that experience. Uh, that book, Steps to Christ, was my entry into a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, the book got me into Scripture. I remember looking up all the verses of Scripture that are referenced, and that plunged me into my Bible, and that's where I came to know Jesus as a as a personal friend, my Lord, 
and Savior. I understood what it means to have salvation in Christ. I already had an understanding of, of what it means to, to be a Christian. I, I was raised in the United Methodist Church. I had studied with Baptists, so the ideas of what it means to be saved and saying you're saved, I was familiar with that and understood it and considered myself a, a Christian who was saved. Uh, as I plunged into the scripture as, as a new Adventist, that it simply reinforced that understanding. And so over the years, Jesus is truly, he's, he's my best friend. Theologically, he's my, my Lord, he's my Savior. I depend on him for salvation. Uh, I have that wonderful assurance of salvation. I've learned I cannot trust in myself. Uh, I have to trust totally in Jesus for my salvation, for my my life, for experience, for everything. The greatest thing about uh, Christianity for me is experiencing the presence of God during my devotional life, engaging with the scriptures. I hear Jesus speak to me from the Bible. Uh, it's it's the word of God, but it's also a personal word from God to me. Throughout my entire Christian experience, the, the promises of God have meant everything to me. Claiming those promises and hearing the voice of Jesus speak to my soul as my friend during what I call for my students, tag time, time alone with God, engaging in that devotional life, that's where I've heard the voice of Jesus speak to me through his word. And that, I think, has been the foundation of my Christian experience over the years. So I'm just grateful to have a Savior who loves me personally. I'm going to begin this second section by directly reading the eighth fundamental belief which reads as follows. All humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being, endowed with freedom of choice, in self-exaltation, became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the created world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the global flood as presented in the historical account of Genesis 1-11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict, out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. So Dr. Lake, we just finished reading the eighth fundamental belief. Does the Bible teach this concept of a great controversy or cosmic conflict, or is this a teaching exclusive to the writings of Ellen White? That is the key question. And I think just a surface level reading of the Bible, one can discern there is an epic battle between good and evil. I mean, that's just basic Bible 101. You read about this adversary in the scriptures, and that adversary is against Christ. That adversary deceived God's people in the Old Testament, and he attempts to destroy Christ and his people in the New Testament. At the very outset of the Bible, this controversy, this what I like to call this cosmic conflict, is set forth. God creates everything perfect. And then in Genesis 3, you have suddenly this serpent come on the scene, this crafty serpent. And that serpent has evil intentions. And as you read the narrative, the serpent causes Adam and Eve to disobey God and plunge the human race into sin. It's as if Moses presupposes that his readers understand that there's more to the story than this. There's a story behind that serpent. And when you read the rest of Scripture, the pieces of the puzzle come together. 
But the key verse, I think, foundational to Scripture is Genesis 3, 15. After Adam and Eve have fallen into sin, you have God comes and it's like a, a, a investigative type of judgment scene. God calls for Adam and Eve. Where are you? And then they acknowledge the sin, their sin. And then you have God pronouncing the sentence. And if you study Genesis 3 carefully, it's it's written in what is called a chiastic structure that builds to a literary center, an apex. And the center of that chapter, the literary center, which is the most important part, is Genesis 3, 14 and 15, where God speaks directly to the serpent. Verse 14, he curses the serpent. Later in scripture, we know that the force behind that serpent, the person behind that serpent is Satan, the great adversary. He is cursed. But Genesis 3, 15, right at the heart of the chapter is the promise of a savior, a savior. It's called a first gospel, pro-evangelium a first gospel in the scripture because it promises the coming of a redeemer. It is a messianic promise. The he, at the deepest level of the verse, the he is against the serpent. In fact, the text reads, he shall bruise your head, speaking to the serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. That he is a personal masculine pronoun, that is the promise of a redeemer. And you read the rest of Genesis, it flows out of this verse. But what is important is the word that begins the whole verse, which actually the sentence begins with the Hebrew word for enmity, which means intense hostility. Now, we won't be able to unpack this whole verse completely, but that intense hostility reaches its deepest level between the he and the serpent. Moses traces those two seeds, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The Messiah would come through the seed of the woman. Those two are at odds against one another throughout the rest of the book of Genesis. You see that follow throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament when the seed of the woman finds its fullest expression at the birth of Jesus Christ, beginning with the Gospel of Matthew. But as we look over the Old Testament, you have numerous places that refer to this conflict. Job 1, verses 6 through 12, when Satan comes before this celestial meeting of beings before God. Uh, You see the, the cosmic conflict work itself out in the experience of Job and suffering and where the curtain is pulled back and we can see what is taking place. You've got Isaiah 14, 12 and 14, Ezekiel 28, 12 through 18. We won't be able to unpack those in detail right now, but while they're talking about earthly kings, the language in the Hebrew shifts in a very careful way to something beyond a human power, which indicates a a supernatural power of evil. And so those two passages in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, uh, there have been doctoral dissertations written about those, those verses and indicating that this is clearly a reference to Lucifer's self-exaltation in heaven. But the real apex of the conflict in Scripture occurs in the four Gospels with namely the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with the temptations where Jesus and Satan face one another, one another, eye to eye, toe to toe, locked in conflict. You clearly see the cosmic conflict taking place right there. It's clear that the battlefield of this conflict is planet Earth. That's quite clear from Scripture. This is something that several evangelical scholars have acknowledged and recognized, especially when you come to the New Testament epistles. Paul references Satan several times in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. In Ephesians 2, 2, he calls the devil the prince of the power of the air, and it climaxes in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. Let me read that verse to you, or the famous armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The key word there is wrestle. The term meant hand-to-hand combat. Christ and Satan are locked in combat. That's clear through scripture. 
but human beings are also in this combat. Whether we yield to Christ or yield to Satan, the two forces back and forth. The beauty of the Bible is that it's clear at the very outset. Back to Genesis 3.15. He will bruise your head, you shall bruise his hell. The crushing of the serpent's head is a theme that runs throughout the entire Old Testament and into the New Testament, climaxing in the book of Revelation. And that head of that serpent is progressively crushed throughout Scripture. The death blow to Satan was Christ's death on the cross. And then his victorious resurrection. This was a, a major crushing of the serpent's head, particularly his death on the cross. He defeated Satan. Satan is a defeated foe, yet since the cross and resurrection, Satan knows he is doomed. And that's where Revelation 12, 12 comes into play and reads, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you. In the earth and the sea, the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Ever since the first advent of Christ, Satan knows his doom is near, so he is doing everything he can. And then you come to the culmination in Revelation 10, 20, where the devil is thrown into the lake of fire. That's the ultimate crushing of the serpent's head. I certainly should add Chapter 12 of Revelation speaks of the war in heaven. So we go back and forth in scripture. This was a, a cosmic conflict that began in heaven. Lucifer brought his rebellion down to this earth. You see that in Genesis 3, and the rest of scripture flows out of that. But thank goodness you have the Redeemer, because the central focus of the cosmic conflict, it's really the storyline of scripture. If you follow the storyline of scripture, I believe flowing out of Genesis 3.15, you have the promise of the Messiah who will defeat Satan. And the heart of the Bible, the climax, culmination of the storyline of Scripture is the redemptive work of Christ at Calvary and in, and in his, his resurrection, his ascension, um, his high priestly ministry, and his coming back again. His redemptive work has and will defeat the devil. That's quite obvious from a reading of Scripture. Seventh-day Adventist theology simply follows that meta-narrative, that story in Scripture of the conflict between Christ and Satan. But we must remember that there was a time before when heaven was all in bliss before the rebellion in heaven and Satan and his angels were cast out. But then there's that future hope of a time when the earth is made new, and there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more evil. There'll be happiness throughout eternity with God's throne, his sanctuary established on this earth, the earth made new. It's the ultimate underdog story. This earth where sin abounded will one day be the very presence of God throughout the universe, all time, and eternity. That's what the cosmic conflict is about. And for the Christian who is in Christ, it means victory. It means victory. His victory is your victory, my victory. That's the hope that the Christian has. And that is the story Seventh-day Adventists seek to tell. Ellen White in her Cosmic Conflict series is simply following the biblical storyline, not the other way around. So as with our last section, I'm going to open by quoting in full the 10th fundamental belief, which reads as follows. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and exercise faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, substitute and example. This saving faith comes through the divine power of the Word and is the gift of God's grace. Through Christ, we are justified, 
adopted as God's sons and daughters, and delivered from the lordship of sin. Through the Spirit, we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds, writes God's law of love in our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in Him, we become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. So Dr. Lake, the Bible warns against teaching a false gospel. And so the question is begged, does the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church, and Ellen White for that matter, teach a false gospel? The key question, because that issue has been raised, and Adventists are, are accused of teaching a false gospel. Uh, answering Adventism is really hammering that, that issue home. Uh, we have a false gospel, a false Christ, and so forth. Is there a false gospel in Adventism? There are some Adventists, I believe, that teach a false gospel. Uh, you'll you'll find pockets of legalism within Adventism. I have to be honest. I've seen it, encountered it myself. But I would argue it's not fair to broad brush all Adventist as legalist and teaching a false gospel. I believe that. Adventism as a whole has the biblical gospel. What is the biblical gospel? What have I as a Seventh-day Adventist professor and theologian taught in my classes, my college classes, religion classes over the last 27 years I've taught at Southern Adventist University? What, what have I taught in terms of the gospel? What does Adventist scholarship teach about the gospel? What do Adventist in mainstream Adventism, teach about the gospel. I believe you've got in Adventism, mainstream Adventism, which is where the current is the strongest, the, the flow of the main church, its teaching, its scholarship, its, its members. But then on the side, like any river, you've got streams, currents along the edges. And you've got the more conservative, ultra-conservative streams, and you've got the more... Uh, liberal, progressive type of streams, but then you've got the mainstream where the current is the strongest, and that's where I'm coming from. That's what I represent is mainstream Adventism. Of course, we all would like to say we're in the middle, uh, but that's what I endeavor to follow. And uh, I have seen false gospels, particularly in the ultra-conservative side, that don't really grasp the significance of what Christ has done. What is the gospel? The biblical gospel. I believe, as a Seventh-day Adventist, that the biblical gospel is the gospel, and that is what we should believe and teach as Seventh-day Adventists. Do Seventh-day Adventists teach a false gospel? I would argue, in general, no. Here's how I define the gospel. The gospel is the good news of the eternal pre-existence, incarnation, life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, enthronement, intercession, judgment, return, and ultimate restoration of Christ for the salvation of all who believe in him and follow him. Now, I'm deriving that from scripture. Those are all the redemptive works of Christ. Those are parts of the whole. Scripture talks about these parts, but connects them as a whole, Christ's redemptive works. The gospel really is, or another way of putting it, it's a story of the redemptive works of Christ. But let's be clear, the heart and center is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is quite clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where Paul gives the essence of the gospel, and he capitalizes on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel, the doing, the dying, and the rising of Christ. The gospel is Christ. It is his work for us. So his completed work on the cross, that's the basis of my salvation. That's the basis of justification by faith. The forensic declaration of acquittal, of pardon, based on what Christ has done on the cross. It's about forgiveness. It's about wearing that perfect robe of righteousness that he established during his perfect life. 
He lived a perfect life in perfect obedience to God's requirements, to God's laws. And that life is placed in my behalf. The imputation of Christ's righteousness, that's that's a part of this gospel. So the death of Christ is everything. Paul puts a lot of emphasis on the death of Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ. But as you read through scripture, the gospel also envelops all the works of Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, and his high priestly ministry. There is a book by a scholar outside of Adventism that understands atonement in a similar way that Adventists do. We definitely believe that the atonement was complete at the cross, no question. But there's a broadening of the atonement it continues in Christ's work in heaven, in his high priestly intercession. David M. Moffat, in his book, Rethinking the Atonement, New Perspectives on Jesus' Death, Resurrection, and Ascension, published in 2022 by Baker Academic, evangelical scholar, but is, is taking a position that is something Adventists have taught all along. Listen to how he articulates it. This is the basic idea of his book. Jesus saves his people by dying, yes, but even more by rising, ascending, and now interceding for them at the right hand of the Father. Because the love of Jesus for his siblings extends, and by siblings he means us, his his people, because of the love of Jesus for his siblings extends beyond the cross to include his ongoing intercession, nothing can separate us from God, Romans 8, 35 through 39. Not only did Jesus die for us, he now also intercedes for us before the Father. These aspects of his saving work are held together in his person. They are part of who he is. Jesus is the one who died, rose, ascended, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. These creedal affirmations, which help to identify who the Son of God is, are all a part of how he saves his people from their sins. There is no one event in the life of the incarnate Son of God that does all the work of salvation. As essential as all these several events are for salvation, they are held together in the person of the incarnate Son, Jesus. It is Jesus who saves his people from their sins, not the death of Jesus or even the so-called Christ event, but it's Jesus himself. And certainly, uh, you read the, the book, this author is not diminishing the death of Christ in any way, and it's, it's foundational role. So yes, we, we emphasize the finish and completed work of Christ, the atonement of Christ on the cross, but we see the gospel in its fullness that takes us all the way to the end of Scripture, the finale of Scripture, which is the ultimate restoration of all things in the earth made new. That's the extent of the gospel, but without question, its core is the doing and the dying and the rising of Christ. That, I believe, is the testimony of Scripture. That, I believe, is the Adventist understanding of the gospel when Adventism is at its best. And I would argue that if you read Ellen White, major spokesperson for Seventh-day Adventist, if you read her carefully, comprehensively, the theme of righteousness by faith. Salvation in Christ runs like a golden thread all through her writings. Let me share a statement here that shows how important the cross was in her thinking. Here's what she wrote. This is manuscript release uh, 49, 1898. It's in manuscript, manuscript releases, volume 21 and page 37. I quote, hanging up on the cross, Christ was the gospel. Now we have a message. She's writing to Adventist leaders here. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Will not our church members keep their eyes fixed on a crucified and risen Savior in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered? This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope for every believer. If we can awaken an interest in men's minds that will cause them to fix their eyes on Christ, we may step aside and ask them only to continue to fix their eyes upon the Lamb of God. That's one of many, many statements that she makes. She repeatedly called ministers to uplift Christ in his life, Christ in his death, Christ 
in his resurrection, Christ in his ascension, Christ in his high priestly ministry, and Christ in his coming back again. Ellen White emphasized that holistic understanding of the gospel articulated throughout the New Testament, especially. Now, you can read statements. Critics will quote statements that seem to say something different from that. But if you read them in their context, you have to understand that Ellen White always had balancing statements. She's very consistent on this issue with faith and works. If she emphasized salvation freely, she also wanted people to know, coming from her Wesleyan Arminian framework, that one, if one relaxes too much, you could get into trouble and lose your walk with Christ and lose your spirituality. But on the other hand, for those who never seem to have assurance, who were depending upon themselves, she always emphasized the gospel. So she's always endeavoring to capture that tension that we find in scripture itself between faith and works. In fact, I think the classic verse on this matter, one of many, of course, but a classic verse is in Ephesians. And this is what I find this theme enunciated throughout Ellen White's writings. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10, Paul writes, for by grace, classic verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I find that articulated throughout Adventist literature. I find that articulated throughout Ellen White. But notice the, the connection here in the next verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared beforehand. He, he uh, ordained that we would walk in newness of life. And those good works in the context of this verse are clearly based on what Christ has done. The fact that we're not saved by works. I find that dual theme of faith and works, assurance and belief, Christ's work and human effort pulled together in scripture and always held in tension in the writings of Ellen White. And there is a whole movement of, of scholars now that are rejecting the Calvinistic approach and nothing against Calvinism. I studied at a Calvinist seminary. Uh, my first doctorate was from Reformed Theological, Theological Seminary. I respect Reformation theology. I respect reform theology and Calvin in many, many ways, but obviously there are significant differences. A number of scholars now, staunch biblical scholars, are recognizing the Arminian approach to salvation that it is possible one can lose their salvation. And this is not just Adventists, this is many other biblical scholars. If you go to renew.org, that is a whole website dedicated to this. Uh, that is possible one can still lose their salvation, yet by trusting in Christ, one can always have assurance of salvation. The fact that one could eventually leave Christ, that they have the right, the choice to walk away from Christ, does not have to diminish their assurance of salvation. That's the framework of the gospel understanding in Adventism, is that, that Arminian framework, that Wesleyan Arminian framework. Uh, Jacob Arminius, um, contemporary with Calvin, um, agreed with Calvin on a lot of things, as many of us would today, but he also parted from Calvin in the issue of free will and salvation. So there are these nuanced differences within evangelicalism today, both the Reformed Calvinists and the Arminian. That's been a, a conflict uh, for several hundred years now, but it's it, there are these two themes in evangelicalism today, and Adventists clearly fall on the side of the Arminian, more particularly in the Wesleyan, the, the framework of John Wesley. Ellen White grew up in the American version of John Wesley's church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, and mentored from John Wesley, and Wesley clearly taught salvation, yet one can choose to walk away from Christ. But I would argue it is, and, the, and many Adventists need to understand this, it is harder to lose salvation than many people think. Christ is not going to let you go that easy. But ultimately, 
The choice is up to the individual. Paul talks about grace. Grace is, we're in an era of grace since Christ has come and salvation is so near to all. Christ offers his, his life for us, his righteousness for us, his death on the cross, all we need to do to accept it. And that is the basis and foundation of our salvation throughout our entire Christian experience. But the beauty of the gospel is it doesn't leave you where Christ finds you. It changes you. It transforms you by the indwelling grace of God. That's the beauty of justification, righteousness, and sanctification, righteousness. Justification is something that's the foundation uh, that imputed righteousness of Christ. It will never leave us. We can never be without it. It's the basis of our assurance. But sanctification is that work that uh, of, of Christ making us more and more like him, the indwelling Holy Spirit that is the work of a lifetime and will really never end until glorification at the second coming, whether it be translation or resurrection. Uh, that's that's the beauty of the gospel. It changes us. It transforms us. It empowers us to live a new life, a new life. In fact, as I read uh, various evangelical understandings of the gospel, one that I really like uh, by Daryl Bach, who's a well-known New Testament scholar. He says this, the gospel is about entry into a relationship with God in which he empowers and enables us to live in a fallen world in which there's a lot of pressure in a way that is honoring to God and faithful to him. And in that walk of that life, God is well represented of how we live. So it's a new relationship, a transforming relationship. And he says that is the core of the gospel as we see it in the early church. And that's in a presentation where he's discussing the gospel in the context of the book of Acts. So this is what you find in one other uh, uh, evangelical theologian, Michael Goheen articulates the gospel in a way that Adventists would resonate with. He says that the gospel, it's about the fulfillment of a long story that's being narrated in the Old Testament and finds its, its fulfillment in the New Testament, in the Christ event. He says the gospel is is about the goal of cosmic history. It's about the restoration of the entire creation and all of human life which takes place at the end of the book of Revelation and that promise of the earth made new. What shall we say? A comprehensive nutshell, but that's a nutshell of the gospel as Seventh-day Adventists understand it, I believe, and, and the gospel that I have read in Adventist literature and Adventist scholarship that I've taught myself. And let me just share a book that I would suggest that many who watch this, you should read, especially if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, and especially for those like Miles who want to engage with Adventist theology about salvation and the gospel. It's this book. It's called Salvation Contours of Adventist Soteriology by Seventh-day Adventist scholars. It covers all the major aspects of salvation, the gospel, the nature of sin, the atonement of Christ completed at the cross, the atonement in heaven. All of those aspects are completed dealt with here. If anybody wants to engage Adventism on the gospel, this is the definitive book to read. And Miles, I commend him. He's one of the first critics I've seen that seriously engage with Adventist scholarship, but he needs to do it fairly and comprehensively. And that book should be on his list for reading. So in a nutshell, that's the Adventist understanding of the gospel as I see it. Dr. Lake, I'm grateful that you love Christ Jesus as he's both the creator and savior. And that reminds me of what Peter says in his second epistle. Peter states, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Dr. Lake, you made a similar statement on growth in your book, Ellen White Under Fire, where you said, We as a people still have a lot of self-educating and growing to do. There are other mistakes we need to work on as well. To those who once were a part of us, but who got discouraged because of an oppressive use of Ellen White's writings, all I can say is that I'm sorry. What you experienced was not right or fair to you as a human being made in the image of God. So with that in mind, Dr. Lake, how can the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church grow in terms of its presentation of the gospel? Well, I can't help but think of George Knight's 
uh, prolific Adventist historian, uh, his statement that he's he's met Adventist vegetarians meaner than the devil. Well, I've met some of those too. And that is a most unfortunate witness. Cold, mean-spirited, Advent, mean-spirited Adventist. They're around. I don't believe that represents the majority of Adventists, but there's enough of them that they seem to make an impact. I think of Ellen White's statement in Ministry of Healing, page 477, or poor, excuse me, page 470. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. That, Christopher, that's how we can improve our presentation of the gospel. Not just proclaim the gospel, but to be the gospel. I think of Michael Gorman. Theologian Michael Gorman in his, his excellent book, Becoming the Gospel, Paul, Participation, and Mission, published in 2015. Uh, he argues that, that we shouldn't just participate in the gospel, but we should become the gospel. That's what Adventists should do. You know, we get caught up in doctrine apart from life so often. And that has created this bad witness to be loving and lovable people. Maybe we need to stop arguing theology sometimes and just live our faith and be kind and courteous and good. There are, there are horror stories of people who have experienced mean Adventist. And unfortunately, those seem to get all the attention. But there's also plenty of Adventists who are self-sacrificing in their life and are reaching out to save the lost just to help their fellow brother or sister around them. That's that's the greatest way to enhance our presentation of the gospel. I think of this other statement in Gospel Workers, page 156 by Ellen White. Of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. The proclamation of the third angel's message calls for the presentation of the Sabbath truth. But notice what she says. This truth, with others included in the message, is to be proclaimed, but the great center of attraction, Christ Jesus, must not be left out. It is at the cross of Christ that mercy and truth meet together and righteousness and peace kiss each other. The sinner must be led to look to Calvary with the simple faith of a little child. He must trust in the merits of the Savior, accepting his righteousness, believing in his mercy. That's how we should live. For our final fundamental belief section, we'll be covering multiple questions while examining your book, Ellen White Under Fire, and the 18th fundamental belief, which reads as follows. The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make it clear that the Bible is a standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. So Dr. Lake, the subtitle for your book, Ellen White Under Fire, is identifying the mistakes of her critics. This naturally begs the question, what exactly are the alleged mistakes of Ellen White's critics? What is the state of Ellen White criticisms today? Of course, that's a, the answer to that is, is would be a full-orbed presentation. But uh, for this purposes, we're just we're just giving as concise as possible as answers to these. But basically, in a nutshell, the issue I find with critics repeatedly, past and present, is a lack of context in the charges that they make. So often, and in recent literature I've read, the same thing happens again. They'll cite a sentence by Ellen White and read into it, here is a heretical teaching, without examining its context. Not a word about the paragraph or the page that it's in, the flow of thought of Ellen White. And by doing that, you can read something into a sentence that's completely foreign to the author's ideas. People do that with the Bible all the time, and I find that's what critics repeatedly do with Ellen White. Context. Context is the key. We've got to read the literary context as well as the historical context. We talk about source documentation. 
Um, that is a term that is so important. And there's a lot that has already been written dealing with all the issues with regard to Ellen White and Adventist teachings, source documentation within Adventist history and within the context of Ellen White's writings is crucial. There is more material that is coming out. Advent, Adventist scholars are working on lots of material. There are three major works coming out on the issue of the triune God, the Trinity, that need attention because of misunderstandings within the church with regard to the anti-Trinitarianism, as well as misunderstandings outside and charges of the critics. So there are works to yet to come. There are in work right now, and that is going to bring light to a lot of these issues. But again, again and again, it's going to be the issue of context. Context, context, context. I notice in, in several of Miles' streams in the background, there's a statement that says, context is king. Well, I would agree with that. To determine who really makes context king is to is how they use the writings. For example, the writings of Ellen White. Is context really king in the charges against Ellen White? My experience in reading is that it's not. So that's where the issue comes. Now, let me give a background of, of criticisms, criticisms of Ellen White. My book was written, Ellen White Under Fire, 14 years ago. There's been a lot of change since that time. And there was that book was in response to a wave of charges that had been um, placed on the internet. The internet was newer in those days, and it was gaining momentum. And the critical presentations against Ella White had gained a lot of momentum. So I was responding to that. Since then, the group proclamation, for example, has, has continued with a steady stream. Uh, I think that in terms within Adventist circles, their influence was not as big over the last decade, but there's been a resurgence. Uh, they've, they've broken out of their own crowd and are now going on evangelical apologetic sites with their same narrative uh, against, uh, against Adventist. And also, I think the Answering Adventism by Miles, Miles Kettleson, that is a well-done site in terms of the way it's marketed, the way he runs it. It's gaining a lot of traction. Uh, of course, the recent publications of Steve Daly against Ellen White. Uh, these, This is what I see as a new wave of charges against Adventism. So I find these charges, I don't find them alarming. Um, it's been around a long time. It's just coming forth in a new configuration and that type of thing. And there are some new charges that have never been leveled before against Ellen White, as well as Adventists. But I find them to be a good opportunity for us to go back and study, for every Adventist to study. Adventists will often respond with you know, texting and messages on some of Miles' streams, for example, and, and in other places. And that often that, that is not really helpful when you put yourself in an environment like that where what you say can be criticized and, and downplayed and manipulated. What we need to do is listen to the charges and go and find the sources that are referenced and study them for ourselves. And I, I know in my own experience that has increased my faith in Adventism. I, I listen carefully to the charges against Ellen White. I'm, and I'm always listening for how they're used, the context in which they use them. And I go study them out and find responses to it. And that is a most helpful exercise. I believe that's what all Adventists should be doing now in responding to this new wave of charges. The criticisms are not going away and they're probably going to get even more intense. That should challenge us to study for ourselves. Dr. Lake, thank you for outlining the landscape of Ellen White criticisms. And with that being said, may you please clarify the purpose of your book, Ellen White Under Fire, as some might feel that this text did not address the main criticisms of Ellen White in her writings. What is your response? Yeah, I'm glad to, to respond to that because I've heard it a few times and, and, and more recently uh, that my book it didn't deal with the shut door, the plagiarism, the myriad of charges. It's Ellen White under fire. It's a response to all the charges. Actually, that's not the purpose of the book. The book is often criticized for something it's not trying to do. Um, it, it is simply to lay out the underlying issues, issues of 
a history of the criticisms, revelation, inspiration in Ellen White's experience, the authority of Ellen White in relationship to the authority of scripture, and of course, interpretation and the overall themes in her writings. That's the, the issues that the book was dealing with. The nature of fallacious arguments, argumentation as well. So it's not really meant to dive into things such as the shut door. It may mention that, but uh, the book should be addressed by what it's trying to do. I remember Miles, I heard him complaining on one of his streams that Adventists will say to him that he, he didn't address this or that when the purpose of that stream is not to address that. Well, that's the same thing with my book. It was not meant to address all those issues, so it should be treated fairly like I'm sure he wants his streams to be treated fairly, and rightly so. So, Dr. Lake, speaking of your book, one of the core ideas in your book is that D.M. Cantwright raised almost all the issues that would be directed against Ellen White in the future and provided a model that almost all future critics of Ellen White would copy, which is why you called Cantwright the father of Ellen White criticisms. However, is it the case that critics of the life and writings of Ellen White have followed Ken Wright's model? Are there criticisms that have gone beyond Ken Wright's criticisms? Again, my book was published 14 years ago, and a lot has happened since then. At the time of this recording, that was 14 years ago, 2010, when the book was published. And I made this statement that I've heard others use and criticize. I, I describe Can Wright as the father of Ellen White criticisms uh, for four reasons. Um, first, and this is quoting from my book, page 60, uh, in the culmination of his work in the life of Mrs. E.G. White, he recycled criticisms of Ellen White's prophetic ministry from 1845 to the late 1880s covered uh, that I cover uh, in this book. Second, he conceived new criticisms against her, such as the plagiarism and epilepsy charges. I think that's historically accurate with what Canwright did. Third, Canwright raised almost all the issues that would be directed against Ellen White in the future. At his time, there was a lot of truth to that. And at the time I wrote the book, as I listened to all the criticisms, there wasn't much beyond the framework of what Canwright had done. There was a few things, the charge that Ellen White was a drunkard. Uh, Dirk Anders had already raised that charge. But since then, of course, new charges have come. Um, ones that Canwright never addressed. And so that's a part that I would update if I were to, to do a new edition of the book. Uh, or what's happened over the last 14 years. I know the proclamation group has has raise some new issues that Canwright didn't raise, the physicality of God issue. I think Steve Daly, in his book, The Psychobiography of Ellen White, he has taken Ellen White criticisms to a level no one ever has before. His charge that she was a fraud and one of the greatest, probably the, as he puts it, the greatest con artist in history. That's quite extreme. And that is a level that Ellen White criticisms have never gone to before. So clearly, Steve Daly has gone far beyond Canwright. There's something else that I should add, too. Uh, a little bit about who D.M. Canwright was. D.M. Canwright was converted into Adventism in 1859. And for a couple of decades, he became a well-known, well-beloved preacher. And while he was an Adventist, Canwright made some really positive contributions especially in the area of tithing. It was Canwright's study that launched the Adventist church into the major tithing system that it continues today because of scripture. That was Canwright. Canwright made some positive contributions, but Canwright in, uh, had some issues with Ellen White and others over the years. It culminated in his decision to leave Adventism in 1887. It was a peaceful exit. Unfortunately, some Adventist use the word apostasy that was published in the review that offended Canwright, understandably so. And he launched a, uh, his assault on Adventism and continued that for the last 30 years of his life. So he's known as a beloved Adventist preacher while he was in Adventism, but also its most well-known critic of that day uh, in, in uh, once he left Adventism. But the issue with Canwright is over the years, we've tended to demonize Canwright. And there have been myths about Canwright that have spread that are really not true. 
in my own research, and I've researched a lot on Ken Wright and will continue to do so in the future because I find him to be a very interesting person. And I'm interested in his person and being fair with who he was. Obviously, I disagree with his criticisms. But in terms of telling, Wright, telling Ken Wright's story, it should be done apart from any apologetics to his arguments. It should be fair and objective. Now, there has been a, a, a well-known um, narrative of Ken Wright by Kerry Johnson, who claimed to be a secretary. I have found in my research in uh, some of Ken Wright's material that Kerry Johnson was not accurate. In fact, I reject the Kerry Johnson narrative. I think it's unfortunate, and it's not according to the facts that you find out about Ken Wright when you read about his life after he left Adventism. We need to be fair in telling Ken Wright's story. And that hasn't often been the case. And now our critics are exploiting the fact that that, that has not happened at this point. Steve Daly's latest book, The, the Fraud of, of uh, the White Estate Fraud. Um, and there are some things in that book that, uh, you know, that, that I would agree with, but I believe it's one-sided. And I believe there's another, that, that the whole story needs to be told. And I know that the White Estate is, is working on researching that and telling the full story. Of course, as far as he is concerned, the White Estate is untrustworthy. But I believe that when that story is documented with careful research, it will be a balanced presentation of the whole thing. But nevertheless, a lot of us realize that the Kerry Johnson narrative is false. And it is most unfortunate. And that is has not been fair to Can Wright. And I believe that uh, the other biography of Can Wright by Norman Dowdy, who was not a Seventh-day Adventist, was more favorable, was against Adventist and favorable towards Can Wright. Carrie Johnson, of course, was, was favorable towards Adventism and against Can Wright. Both of them tend to take it to the extreme. Although I will acknowledge, I think that the the uh, biography of Can Wright by Norman Dowdy is more is 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 more objective and is a better uh, biography overall. But I believe that the real Can Wright lies somewhere in the middle of those two because both of them are parochial in their presentations and use testimonial evidence and and there's there's a bias working on both sides. Again, this is not to excuse. I think some of the things that happened with Kerry Johnson, which are most unfortunate, but still that, that happens. And I believe the real Ken Wright is somewhere in the middle and his story needs to be told. It's a part of our story. I think we have a right to tell it, but we've got to do it in a fair and objective way, apart from Ken Wright's arguments. So uh, that's, I think those are some of the issues with regard to Ken Wright. To continue examining Kent Wright's criticisms, you state in your book, Ellen White Under Fire, on page 59, that D.M. Kent Wright missed the revival after the 1888 meetings and never mentioned it in his criticism of Seventh-day Adventism. What would you say, Dr. Lake, is the significance of the 1888 meetings and their impact on the Seventh-day Adventist Christian faith today? Yes, and uh, I, I'm just noticing now that critics are attempt, attempting to downplay 1888 because it was a great revival. Adventists have set it forth as a revival of righteousness by faith and so forth, and they're tending to downplay it. But that is one of the, 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 the areas that has a lot of research in Adventist history. George Knight, prolific Adventist historian, has written a lot in that area. Others have, have written material. I've read doctoral dissertations about that as well, and it's documented that, that 1888 it, there was a great revival as a result of that within Adventism. You can read that in the pages of the Review and Herald uh, in the in the early 1890s. Jones and Wagner, two of the major contenders, and by the way, their biographies have been written. So there's a lot of research. George Knight wrote the A.T. Jones biography, and Woody Wooden wrote the uh, E.J. Uh, Wagner. So there's a lot of research that has been done about this issue, and Ellen White. Uh, agreed with the core of what Jones and Wagner said during the 1888 meetings. Not everything that they taught, but but the core of what they said about salvation. And she was determined to get that message out to the church, and they did so. And it brought forth a revival. You can see that in the general conferences during the 1890s. You can see that in the in the Harbor Springs uh, uh, Convention on Education where they changed the course of Adventist education and were determined to make it 
teach the whole Bible with Christ at the center, more gospel-centered Bible teaching. That was a part of the fallout from the 1888 meetings, the positive fallout from it. It's documented of the impact, the positive impact of 1888. That would continue through the rest of the century, although it's important to point out that there was a shift. There was a change uh, in the trajectory of things as you get into the night, uh, the 20th century. Michael Campbell has documented in his books uh, on the 1919 Bible Conference and the 1922 General Conference session, the unfortunate trajectory that things went, the message of salvation got lost sight of, and, and a trajectory of legalism began and, and made its way into the 20th century. And, and that trajectory continued throughout the 20th century. George Knight has documented this in his book, Ellen White's Afterlife, about the way Ellen White was used and abused during that time. She literally was exalted in such a way that, that Sister White walked three feet off the ground. And uh, that is a most insightful book that updates all the research and experience on Ellen White after her death appropriate title, Ellen White's Afterlife. He also wrote End Time Events in the Last Generation, the explosive 1950s, where you have this idea of the last generation attempting to become, to become perfect. And that set in motion a series of events and ideas that, that continue this trajectory of legalism throughout the 20th century. And so by the time you get to the 1970s and you have the, the historical critical research done on Ellen White, it was, the church was not expecting that. By the time you get to the 1980s, Walter Ray's release of his book, The White Lie, the church was not ready for that. The way they had viewed Ellen White, they had forgotten that the uh, plagiarism charge had already been addressed. Canwright had raised it, and it had been addressed in the early decades of the, the century, but it was forgotten, and it was like a bombshell that exploded, and the church was caught off guard. And it was a really challenging time. But again, that caused us to do more research into that topic. Back to 1888. Um, it was revived again in 1988, the centennial of those meetings. And that's where George Knight and others wrote prolifically about this meeting, bringing back what it contributed to the church then and its continuing contribution to us now. Righteousness by faith, the gospel of salvation in Christ bringing justification, sanctification to, to the level of importance in Christian living and Christian assurance. So that's all documented. Just to go back to, to the book, I, I bring out uh, some observations and uh, I point out, and this is what was raised, I believe, in one of the streams on, on answering Adventism in a, in a negative way. Uh, but I point out that Canwright, when he, he left, Canwright embraced the old legalistic Adventism Adventism had spiraled, the second generation Adventism in the 70s and early 1880s had spiraled down into legalism, literally legalism. It was most unfortunate. And that was the situation that they were, were experiencing. And Canwright was actually had been a part of that himself in some of his own arguments that I point out in, in my book. But that left him cold. That left him cold. And, and when he left Adventism, that's what he attacked is that old legalistic Adventism. That can be documented in his book and in Adventism's experience and writings. That's what he was attacking. But when 1888 happened, Canwright had left right before the revival of 1888 and, and the, the years afterward in 1887. And then you read his later books. He never mentioned that. He never turned back to that. Presented Adventism and Ellen White as hopeless, hopelessly lost in legalism. But he was arguing with that old Adventism. True, legalism did continue after that. But ever since 1888, Adventism has been more focused on Christ. And the culmination of that is the gospel, as I shared earlier. But we should, it's important to point out that Ellen White herself, and I've documented this in my book and other places, that she understood the gospel way before 1888. But as a result of 1888, she became more outspoken, more pronounced in emphasizing righteousness in Christ. From 1890 onward, her most Christ-centered books published. And my point is that Canwright 
never acknowledged any of these books. Here's a list of them. And this is on page 59 in my book, Patriarchs and Prophets, 1890, 1892, Gospel Workers, 1892, Steps to Christ, 1896, Thoughts for a Mount of Blessing, 1898, Desire of Ages, considered to be the consummation of her teaching on the on Christ, 1900, Christ Object Lessons, 1903, the book Education, which has gospel themes all through it, 1905, Ministry of Healing, 1911, Acts of the Apostles, and 1915, the second edition of Gospel Workers, and then 1917, uh, really written before she died, but uh, published posthumously after her, her death. Uh, 1917 prophets and kings you find righteousness by faith salvation by faith in christ alone running through each of these books can write in his lifetime in his later years never acknowledged this and that is my point and i believe that can be clearly documented in more than what i even have in the chapter in my book because there's plenty of updates that i can give it for a final question relating to can't write and final question in this section you wrote on page 60 of Ellen White Under Fire, he conceived new criticisms against her, Ellen White, such as the plagiarism and epilepsy charges. Critics of Ellen White's life and writings continue to raise the issue of plagiarism in the writings of Ellen White. So Dr. Lake, this is a two-pronged question. Was Ellen White a plagiarist, and what is the difference between literary borrowing and plagiarism? That is the most popular charge against Ellen White. It has been raised repeatedly in the past, and now with this new surge of Ellen White criticisms, the plagiarism is at the top again. That's the really one of the key charges that Steve Daly uses to say that Ellen White is a fraud because she stole from other authors and plagiarized. So that charge continues unabated. We're not addressing that whole charge in this in this presentation, so I can't go into all the, the depth and comprehensiveness that this, this topic deserves, but I'll just, just summarize here briefly. But the difference between plagiarism and literary borrowing is important. As I think we all realize, plagiarism is a hot topic in our society right now in America. A major university president uh, was just fired over plagiarism. We all need to remember that the legal issues today are different than what they were in the 19th century. Not to deny that there, there clearly was a plagiarism issue back then, but the whole thing is, is, is it's, it's different between now and then, and that fairly has to be considered. But plagiarism, I think all authorities agree that the term applies to intentionally deliberate and unauthorized appropriations by one writer of the words of another in the process of passing them off as his own. I'm reading from a document here that deals with that. Plagiarium, it means kidnapper, to steal. That's most unfortunate when it happens in scholarship and 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 sad when it happens in, in any venue. And that's the major charge against Ellen White that she mindlessly copied from other writers. Literary borrowing occurs when one writer use it, utilizes and employs the ideas or words of another for the purpose of making a particular point. That is the the end product transcends the source from which it came, the source from which the author borrowed. And nowadays, you must give credit. In the 19th century, literary borrowing happened a lot, especially with religious writers and historians of the 19th century. I have presentations I've given on this. Unfortunately, there none of them are online, and that needs to change, and more of that needs to get out there. But you can see... Uh, Clearly, historians were delighted when another historian used their material, even though credit was not given or credit was not given. Uh, religious writers continually um, drew from one another without giving credit. This was evidence in uh, the famous Desire of Ages study by Fred Veltman that happened again and again. So Ellen White was just following the literary conventions of her day. The issues of plagiarism did tighten up as the 19th century progressed. So we need to look at it fairly in the background of its context. In many dimensions we could take in this. Uh, the, I have covered the history of the plagiarism charge in a, a book that was published in 2015, the centennial of Ellen White's death. It's the gift of prophecy in scripture and history. And a lot of, uh, it was more of an academic volume. And uh, you had Adventist scholars from different backgrounds, theologians, historians, Ellen White scholars, and so forth, addressing the, all the 
issue of Ellen White's prophetic gift, the prophetic gift in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And several of them dealt with the literary borrowing of the biblical writers. I wrote the chapter dealing with Ellen White's use of extra biblical sources. That's chapter 17 in the book, beginning on page 316. And uh, I addressed all of the, the charges that have been made about plagiarism in the past, summarize them, and then all of the research that's been done, especially since the release of Walter Ray's classic book, The White Lie, in the early 1980s. I summarize what the scholarship is in, in, in various points there. So a lot of it is there. Of course, you have the famous uh, Vincent Ramick uh, study, a, a lawyer and his team. They studied the plagiarism issue throughout Ellen White's lifetime and concluded that she did not engage in plagiarism, but literary borrowing 300 plus hours of all those cases. Very important study that needs to be understood in its context. Critics often attempt to demean it, but you've got to listen to the whole thing. And then, of course, the Perhaps the most well-known is the Veltman, uh, Fred Veltman study uh, of Desire of Ages, the sources in uh, 15 chapters of Desire of Ages, over 2,000 pages. The document, they meant to just do it in a few years. It took uh, about eight years, over 2,000 pages, the conclusion. And one of the statements is this, that Ellen White was not slavishly dependent upon her sources. And the way she incorporated their content clearly shows that she knew how to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's literary borrowing. Now, if you study scripture carefully, it's replete with literary borrowing. I found this interesting in a stream on answering Adventism, as this was briefly discussed. Uh, and the issue is there's no such thing as, at least if I heard correctly, there's no literary borrowing. Um, only plagiarism. In Ellen White, there's no literary bar when she just plagiarized. But if you apply that to the Bible, you've got a problem because Moses drew from the code of Hammurabi in, 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 in the Pentateuch and numerous other writings of the day. You find the biblical writers clearly interacting with the writings, the literature of their day. This is documented in commentaries, parts of Proverbs and Psalms, utilized Egyptian literature. Solomon drew in one section from of the book of Proverbs, they were all Egyptian proverbs. This is documented in the commentaries, particularly the uh, Zondermann Bible Illustrated Background Commentary. It, it clearly documents Solomon's use of Egyptian literature in writing Proverbs, and some of the Psalms are drawn from that. You come to the New Testament. Luke used numerous sources, as he says in his prologue to his gospel. Paul cited secular philosophers of the day. Paul even used Stoic philosophers in Philippians 4 8, he's drawing from Stoic virtues. But here's the thing, and this is important to point out this does not diminish the inspiration of Scripture at all, because Paul, for example, took those Stoic virtues and turned them on their head and made them Christ centered. You find that repeatedly. John drew from apocalyptic literature of his day in parts of the book of Revelation, and particularly, John used language from a depiction this is in the first part of Revelation, a depiction of a Hellenistic deity to describe the glorified Christ. And he took the language and he modified it where it's exalting this deity, this pagan deity, he modified it to exalt Christ. That's a sophisticated use of literary borrowing. But in the end product fits with the inspiration of the Bible writers. And there are numerous places. This is all documented in scholarly commentaries on scripture. For conservative Christians, it does not have to diminish the ins full inspiration of the Bible as God's word at all. It just shows that God worked in the context of humanity and allowed the biblical writers to have their minds fully engaged and interact with the writings of their day, but to guide them in using those writings to set forth their inspired thoughts about the gospel, about Christ, about God, about God's truth. That's the framework that Ellen White engaged in in terms of her literary borrowing. So there's much more that could be said, uh, except that the plagiarism charge is being trumpeted louder today than in the past. But I don't find any new revelation, any new evidence that she's plagiarized or used more of the writings of others. We've been through this, but still, though, there is work that needs to be done. I think with the renewed emphasis on this, this charge, there's already, I get emails from individuals who are researching this constantly. Kevin Morgan has done a lot of helpful work. In fact, 
we have continued the research and found that I, I if I recall correctly, Veltman said that there was about in his study 30, 32 other sources that Ellen White used in writing the Desire of Ages. Well, Morgan has found about 50. She used 50 resources. But the key is the way in which she used them. And I tell my students in my Life and Teachings of Jesus class that when you're reading the Desire of Ages, you're getting a taste of 19th century thought on the life of Christ. But in that Desire of Ages, you're getting Ella White's unique signature, the way she views it through the cosmic conflict. It's unique to her, even though she drew from authors in various places, but the final configuration is clearly her ideas, her thoughts. At any rate, those are a few a bit of my thoughts on the plagiarism literary borrowing issue. Uh, I believe that there will be more studies to come in the future as this issue has been raised uh, more and more, and uh, I think that'll be good for us to do because we learn more about Ellen White, and uh, so far I see nothing that will diminish the way God worked with Ellen White. The final section will evaluate whether or not the culture of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church is healthy or unhealthy, and will begin by looking at an extended quotation from Ellen White under fire. So Dr. Lake, you wrote, the fact that there are so many former Adventists who say that leaving Adventism was like freedom from bondage or a journey out of legalism dramatically alerts us to the fact that there are still pockets of legalism within the Adventist church, in some cases, sometimes large pockets. To deny this reality would be a gross mistake. In this context, we need to ask ourselves what we as a people have done wrong to create such strong negative feelings in those who left us. Is it all their fault? Or are we to blame as well? Is our local church warm, loving, and friendly? Or is it cold, harsh, and unforgiving? Does our local Adventist community shoot its wounded? Adventists have all too often created a climate that squelches genuine Christian spirituality and fosters legalism. Sometimes, we've even been downright mean-spirited in our Adventism. So indeed, the first step in launching a good offense for Ellen White's prophetic ministry is to acknowledge our mistakes and correct them. So Dr. Lake, with that quote in mind, what actionable steps can Seventh-day Adventist Christians take to foster a healthy culture in their church and have a healthy individual expression of their faith? When Adventism is malpractice, shall we say, when it's um, spiraled down into something legalistic, it can truly be oppressive. My heart aches as I've listened to the testimonies of former Adventists and what they went through actual dialogues with some face-to-face, -face, reading a lot online and other places. Uh, I'm sad. They didn't deserve that. Adventists can be so mean when they're wrong, <laughs> but that spirit still prevails in some circles. Again, as I said before, I don't believe that represents the majority of, of Adventists, but that, that negativity is there. Uh, Ellen White spoke of this again and again. I remember a a friend of mine who left the Adventist church years ago and made this argument that Adventists have all these writings of Ellen White. They should be the most kind, Christ-like people in the world. But because they're not, that shows Ellen White was all wrong and not inspired. I get that, but I don't think it's Ellen White's fault. She emphasized the, the, the love and fellowship that we should have as a people repeatedly. But we haven't listened and really haven't applied that. And too many of our churches are navel-gazing. They're not reaching out. And I believe that preaching, preaching can help change that. Biblical, expository, preaching systematically through God's word. That is something our church needs so much. And a lot of the complaints you hear is that the preaching does not live up to that. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do. I think there's a lot of good preachers out there that are earnest. Um, 
but we just need it to increase more and more. I think we need to change our attitude, not only about one another, but about other Christians. Ellen White is often used to demarcate us from other Christians. But really, if you look at her life and her teaching, the opposite is true. Here are two interesting statements that she made. One is the youth instructor, December 9, 1897. She said about Christians outside of Adventism, we are to manifest the love of Christ through the indwelling of his quickening spirit. Those who differ with us in faith and doctrine should be treated kindly. They are the property of Christ, and we must meet them in the great day of final account. And I could give you example after example in her writings where Ellen White affirmed the faith of other Christians outside of Adventism. She affirmed the Christian faith of her own sisters who never became Seventh-day Adventist. She affirmed the faith of Joshua V. Himes in later life, who never embraced Seventh-day Adventism, but respected the work of Adventists. She affirmed his faith in the second coming of Christ. In the Review and Herald, January 7, 1893, she said this, God has jewels in all the churches. And it is not for us to make sweeping denunciation of the professed religious world, but in humility and love present the, all the truth as it is in Jesus. Let us let men see piety and devotion. Let them behold Christ's likeness of character, and they will be drawn to the truth. He who loves God supremely and his neighbor as himself will be a light in the world. That's the key right there. Let them see our love, not an argument. Not a condemnation from us, but let them see love from us. Let them see caring for one another. Let them see that Adventists are people who care about the welfare of their neighbors. That's what people need to see. And they need to see that we, we appreciate the contributions of other Christians. So those are just a few things, certainly not exhaustive. Thank you for outlining those steps, because before we close... There's an important fact that I'd like to mention. Dr. Lake, neither you nor I was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian faith. We converted to this religion. However, I do know that many people were born to multiple generations Seventh-day Adventist parents in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital who were then reared in a Seventh-day Adventist home, living with their Seventh-day Adventist family while attending a Seventh-day Adventist school and church, all of their friends are Seventh-day Adventists. Then they go to a Seventh-day Adventist college, they get married to a Seventh-day Adventist classmate, and they have Seventh-day Adventist children who start that cycle over again. So the question for you here is, how can Seventh-day Adventist Christians have a well-rounded theological understanding of the scriptural text and avoid being unaware of the world outside of their faith? I think ultimately Adventists need to dive into the Bible like never before. That's something Ella White told us repeatedly, but we haven't really listened to it. I tell my students repeatedly in various classes over the years, there are two ways of reading the Bible. One is horizontally, the other is vertically. Adventists have tended to read the Bible more horizontally. It's like a harmony of the Gospels. You know, you look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew, and you look at it, Mark, Luke, and John, that's horizontal. Horizontal reading of the Bible is going from one verse here, looking at this verse, uh, then the, that, you know, going to Jeremiah, then going to Genesis, and then going to Ezekiel, and then going to John, and then going to Revelation, then going to Daniel. Horizontal like that, there's a place for that thematic reading of Scripture, but sometimes it can fall into the trap of like skipping a rock across water. It skips across the surface, but never goes beneath and really listens to the teaching of the Bible. That's why it's important to not only read the Bible horizontally, to not stop there, but to go deeper than that and read the Bible vertically. That is, take a book of the Bible, start at the top, and read it all the way through. Read it in context. When you do that with the Gospels, for example, Let's take the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which is in all four Gospels. But each Gospel writer puts it at a distinctive juncture in the book and has different theological nuance that you don't find in the other Gospel. When you read Mark through from start to finish, you get a whole different perspective. 
than you might in some of the other gospels. It all harmonizes ultimately, but but fresh new insights into the life of Christ. Reading the Bible that way, reading the epistles of Paul from start to finish, reading the Old Testament books from start to finish, that's how you really understand scripture. That's why it's good to read the Bible through in a year. It can be done several chapters a day. We need to get deeper into scripture. Listen to scripture uh, while driving on your iPhone, uh, while walking, while exercising, letting scripture flow into the mind. So we need to read scripture. Most importantly, vertically, then horizontally. I think that will really help us in uh, addressing issues in our contemporary society, seeing the world through biblical lens, understanding the biblical worldview, and allowing that to shape how we view the world around us. Because there are many competing worldviews, secular worldviews out there, and we must engage them from the perspective of the biblical worldview. If we don't, those other worldviews will literally eat up our minds and diminish the truths of Scripture. Dr. Lake, for our final question in this section, I would like to read an invitation from Miles. Miles writes, If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, we extend a warm and sincere invitation for you to explore our resources. The prospect of questioning deeply ingrained beliefs can be daunting, but remember that truth is liberating. We encourage you to critically examine your faith and engage with our materials comparing them with what you've been taught. So Dr. Lake, before we close, are there any other issues that you would like to address in connection with your recent streams at Answering Adventism? And do you have a word of encouragement for Miles? Well, I, uh, I know Miles. He's a former student of mine. He went to Southern Adventist University some years ago and sat in my philosophy class. And uh, Miles was always a pleasant guy, a smart guy, and always had interesting questions and dialogues. At that point in his experience, as I recall, he might correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like he was, I think, more into, and I remember him discussing this, more into to, uh, more Eastern religion and found Christ after that, after his time when I had him in class, and 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 he got into the Reform faith. And that is his faith now, and on his his website, on the, the, the YouTube channel, it's, there's an emphasis on the Westminster Confession of Faith. And as I mentioned before, I, I have a doctorate from Reformed Theological Seminary. I have great respect for the Reformed faith and, and Calvinism. Obviously, there are, are significant differences, but uh, I find that to be a, uh, my, all my interactions with the Presbyterians. At that point in time, it was the Orthodox Presbyterian Church at Reformed Theological Seminary. Miles is a part of the Presbyterian Church of America. Both of those are the conservative uh branch of of Calvinism and sincere, dedicated Christians, earnest believers in the Bible. I respect Miles for that. Uh, what I disagree with is the way he tends to broad brush all of Adventism, such as it believes in a false gospel and in a false Christ. And by the way, in another venue, I'm going to be addressing the Trinity. That has not been a topic of conversation here. He's engaged me on some on a presentation that I made that I think was misunderstood and I'll be addressing that in another venue, but he tends to just a broad brush uh, Adventist as all lost, um, as all believing in a false gospel. And as I mentioned before, that's not really the case. Yes, there are pockets of legalism and a false gospel within Adventism, but that's not the whole. So I would encourage fairness. A lot of Adventists, and not only with Miles, but other with the proclamation group and others, I think many Adventists listen to that. And what I hear is, and I know my own experience, and those I know who who engage with this as well, you shake your heads and say, wait a minute, that's that's not what I believe. That's not accurate. That's very legalistic what you're saying. I get it, but that's what I believe. If, if let's say if Miles is right, and others that are saying the things he's saying, and that Adventism really is this hopelessly deceptive, legalistic group of people. Man, I would flee Adventism. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. If if what Steve Daly says about Ellen White was true, I would have left Ellen White long, long ago. But in my own experience, can can I just 
Based it on my own experience of engagement with Ellen White, with Adventism for over 40 years, I've not found that to be true. What I found is many misinterpretations within Adventism. That's been the problem. And legalism within Adventism, that's been the problem, but not Adventism itself, not Ellen White herself. So I would encourage, urge fairness. Engage Adventism where it needs to be engaged, but acknowledge that their Adventist scholars are really earnestly searching the scriptures and seeking to set forth biblical truth as, as accurately as they can and acknowledge that. Um, instead of broad brushing us all as having a false view of the Trinity, that's not really fair. Um, what What is the real biblical teaching? I, I've listened to, to Miles about uh, where he quotes isolated statements from Adventist scholars, as well as myself. And uh, it just reads something into it that is not there. However, Miles' invitation that you just read, Christopher, I would agree. Um, as I said before, these, these are opportunities for us to study more. Uh, I don't think all Adventists are going to enjoy listening to you know the, the negativity about Adventists on venues such as as answering Adventism and the proclamation group and so forth. But those who do, it could be an opportunity to really compare. I think if you're going to engage with that, okay, listen clearly to what Miles or others say. Don't judge them as persons. I'm not judging Miles' Christian experience at all. I respect what he's doing in many ways in terms of actually engaging with Adventist scholars. I would just, I would just urge to do it in a fair way. But yes, engage with what he says, then go back to the sources and really study it out for yourself. If Ellen White is quoted as saying this, and that's legalism, or that's a false gospel, well then take that statement, find it, study it, read it in its context for yourself, and then listen to what Adventist literature says. Listen to Adventist scholars. Listen to just the, 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 the teaching itself and compare that with your past experience. So yes, I agree with Miles. Examine it. Um, I believe truth can bear the, the greatest scrutiny. Um, it needs to be examined, our teachings within the Bible, but that needs to come with a background of personal engagement with Jesus in a devotional life and in study of the scriptures. And we need to read the Bible first as Adventists, Ellen White as second. You know, I say to Adventists, I want you to read, or I want you to read Ellen White, but I want you to read your Bible more. I don't need Ellen White to prove anything that I believe. Don't need her for that. It's all in scripture. But as I read scripture, then I listen to Ellen White, I find beautiful applications of scriptural truth. And in a similar way that uh, Lutherans appreciate Luther and Calvinists would, would read in, in John Calvin or the Puritans. I, by the way, am a great fan of Puritan literature. And it was back in my studies at Reformed Theological Seminary where I encountered the Puritans. And I have most of their works today. I read the Puritans. That They're very much a part of my, my uh, spiritual diet outside of scripture. Um, I, I greatly respect them. So there's so many wonderful teachings out there in Christianity. And Ellen White reflects that, uh, but, but reflects scripture. And so for the Adventists, that primary authority should be scripture before anything else. And then Ellen White will have a place in the Adventist experience. After that, I believe that she does have a voice that we need to hear. And when she is heard correctly and in context, uh, there's a great blessing to be drawn from those writings. They can really help produce deeper spirituality, a love for God and our fellow human beings, a love for scripture, ultimately a love for Jesus. So uh, I would, again, to P, to Miles and others, don't do broad brushing. That's not really fair. Be fair, but hey, I know that that's your mission to engage us, and uh, I think we can learn from it. Hopefully we will. Dr. Lake, we've now come to our concluding question. Speaking of encouragement, do you have a passage from the Bible that speaks to your heart that you would like to share? Certainly. Of course, there are a number of verses that I just love. Um, of course, the you know, Genesis 3.15 is so foundational um, to me in Scripture. Um, 
But Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my right hand of righteousness. That's been such a great encouragement. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord. I know you said one, but I, I got to do more than one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And then I think the one in terms of just gospel assurance that I think expresses Adventist faith is a statement by Paul in Romans chapter 8. And I want to read this one because it's it's so powerful. But it's Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And I think of this in light of the Adventist understanding of the judgment, which is misunderstood by many Adventists and especially by former Adventist critics as well, because the judgment is good news. And for those who believe in the gospel, the judgment is one of assurance. But in that backdrop, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is It, it is God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, it is, is also risen. You see the core gospel there? Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That is a part of that. The gospel is the intercession of Christ as well. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? These unforgettable words of Paul are so meaningful to all of us, to me. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, that, that is my quintessential promise right there. And I think Miles would agree with me on that one. Dr. Lake, thank you very much for your time. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to listen to this broadcast from Christ Jesus Ministries and Ellen White Answers. You can find the websites of Answering Adventism, Ellen White Answers, the Advent Defense League, and Christ Jesus Ministries LLC in the description. You'll also find a link to the Christ Jesus Ministries merch store and a link to purchase Dr. Lake's Ellen White Under Fire for the affordable price of $10. In my opinion, this is the best review of the writings of Ellen White that exists. And whether you affirm Ellen White or not, you won't want to miss out on Dr. Lake's informative work. We thank you again for listening, and we pray that God blesses you and your loved ones. And remember, the truth saves.